a man born on the other side of the world. He was born uh, many years ago in Bangladesh. Now, not much was known about his upbringing, but he grew into a very tough man, a physically tough man, and he was known for having a ferocious temper. And one day, um, when he was a, a grown man, he got into, he's very hot-headed, and he got into an argument. It's a true story. Got into an argument with his cousin, uh, and he was in a public place, and they had an argument over a girl. And my, um, this man um, uh, stormed off, but he felt um, very disrespected. And in Bangladesh, respect was a really, really big thing in their culture. So um, he left the scene, felt embarrassed, humiliated, and, and as though he'd been disrespected. So he came back later on to the same scene and uh, armed with an axe. And with the axe, he attacked his cousin, um, the man who disrespected him, and he killed him. Killed him with an axe. And, uh, and for that, he, it's a true story, for that he spent a long time in prison. And he was in a prison in Bangladesh. Um, next thing we hear about his story is that um, King George over here in England, uh, he was on his deathbed. And whenever the tradition was, is that whenever a king, this is true, whenever a king in England uh, died, um, that they would open the prison doors and let, for a certain amount of time, not everyone would get out, but if you happened to be close to the prison doors at that time, at the moment the king died, they'd open them and some prisoners would get out. And this man, he, um, he, he, he had wind, he had news that, that the prison doors might be opened. So he didn't eat for days. Um, he camped out at the prison doors. And when, the, when King George died, the prison doors opened and this man got out of prison. And in the months to come, uh, he managed to make his way from Bangladesh all the way through Asia, through Europe. And he managed to stow away on a boat uh, to the UK. Uh, but then his boat, um, it wasn't the most secure boats, but um, it, it broke up in, the, uh, and in, in a storm. And he, wa he got washed up onto the shores of England, a uh, true story, uh, clinging on to a bit of driftwood. So he found himself on a beach, um, uh, washed up, only having the clothes that were on his back. Uh, didn't have any skills. Uh, the only thing he had were his fists, and, um, and he knew how to handle himself, but that was it. And from there, he made his way to London. Uh, and he began to build himself a life in London. And he, uh, he developed a skill. One skill that he developed was he became a genius with cards, with a pack of cards. It was said that uh, it, the, the sleight of hands that he had is he could just do miracles with a pack of cards. So he set up in underground, uh, he, he bought a cafe, all with cash, um, and set up an underground gambling den underneath this cafe, made a lot of money. Uh, he had many prostitutes in the east end of London who would work for him, um, and he built up a, a criminal empire, an, an underworld empire. And uh, then he, he met a woman, and they had 12 children, uh, 12 children they had. And um, uh, for that, for, for them, it, that's a normal size for a Bangladeshi family. Um, and his family became known as one of the biggest criminal families in the East End of London. And many of his children uh, spent time at various points in their lives in prison for drug trafficking, drug dealing, prostitution, um, uh, GBH, ABH. Um, and one of his youngest daughters, true story, had a particularly tough life. Um, at the age of 11, uh, she was in a park where she was attacked by a stranger in the park. And the stranger uh, attacked her, uh, raped her, uh, sexually molested her, uh, did all sorts of things. And um, this woman, uh, his daughter, never came to terms with what really happened to her when she was younger and the trauma that she had. Uh, at 19, um, his daughter, uh, at 19, she met and married a man who was violent towards her, uh, wasn't very nice to her, gambled all of their money away, would come home from work um, and take out all of his temper on her. Um, and she, his, his, one of his daughters, had two children herself. Um, but 
after she had these two children, she went through a messy divorce with her husband. Um, and, and as she got older, uh, this is the mom, um, uh, she, um, she developed mental illness and something called obsessive compulsive disorder from the trauma of what had happened to her when she was younger. Uh, at, at one point, it got so bad she was sectioned, put into a mental hospital, and her two children were put into foster care. And a bit later, she managed to get her to fight to get her children back, um, but she never got over the trauma that happened to her earlier in life. That woman is my mum, and that man was my granddad. Um, so I officially am good on my natural side, a quarter Bangladeshi. Um, that is, folks, part of my story. Um, my granddad from Bangladesh um, and my mum, uh, the life that she set up for herself here. And you know, that is a part of my story. It's a story that I was born into. It's a story that shaped me and affected me and um, shaped me into the person that I am today. And you know, I wonder, you know, we've all got a unique story. You have got a unique story. No one's quite got a story like yours. And I bet no one's quite got a story like mine neither. But you see, our story, my story, your story, our stories are warped. Um, they're broken. Um, and the reason is, is that all of our stories are marred and affected by the effects of sin. None of us can get away from it. It's a condition we're born into. Uh, maybe you've got a different story. Maybe you're a PK. I heard this one, someone say this the other week. I'm a PK. PK stands for pastor's kid. Maybe your mum and dad were pastors. You know, maybe you were brought up in the church. But even if your parents were pastors, it, and even if they passed you down loads of good stuff. By the way, one of the things that my mum, despite all the stuff she went through, one of the things she passed down to me and my sister is that we always knew, no matter what we went through, that my mum loved us. And I'm so thankful to my mum for that, that through everything, we always knew and always knew to this day that we are wanted and we are loved. Um, not everyone can say that. Maybe you've got a different story and you haven't had that passed down to you. Um, but we've all got different stories. But however good or however bad our stories are, we all carry some brokenness. We all carry the effects of sin because we're all born into this fallen world. So just think about your story for a moment. You know, God sees your story as something that is so, so precious to him. In Psalm 139, verse 17, it says, How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I were to count them, they are more than the grains of sand. You know, my children, they're growing up so fast. Um, and one of the things I, me and Joe love to do is get the old photo books out. We look at when they were young. We look at the story of our children. And, and it just thrills me whenever I look at these old photo books of old memories of my children. I reckon God's got a lot of photo books. I reckon he treasures them like memories. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God? Your testimony, your story, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. The whole truth, all of it, your whole story, God values it. And it's precious to him. But then what happens is that God seeks to enter into our story. Um, you know, like Jesus, he first met a man called Cephas. Uh, sorry, a first man, a man called Simon. And Simon was an ordinary fisherman. Um, if you want to have a look at John 1, verse 42, um, or you can read it from here, it says this. It says that he was brought to Jesus, an ordinary man like you, like me. Maybe think about what his story was as a fisherman. Maybe think about the tales that he could tell um, about 
about life at sea. Maybe some of the adventures or misadventures that he had been on. And Jesus looked at him. Jesus looks at you right now. Not, not the mask that we all put on. <laughs> not the, the story that we want to present. Jesus sees all the way past that. And even right now, I just wonder, by his spirit, Jesus is saying, I'm looking at you. I'm seeing past all the stuff, and I'm looking at who you really are. Jesus looked at him, and Jesus said, I wonder if even then Simon was carrying secrets. Maybe did he have a secret life? Jesus says, I see you. And he says, you are Simon, son of John. Uh, it's almost loaded with brokenness, isn't it? He's like, you are, I see your brokenness. You are broken. You, you, you've got, I know your mother and your father. I knew your grandparents. I knew your great grandparents. I know what wrongs in the family. I know all of your weaknesses and your tendencies. You are Simon, son of John. But you will be Cephas which when translated is Peter. And as we know, Peter is the rock on which Jesus chooses to build his church. You are right now, Simon, but you will be Cephas. See right there, Jesus is saying, this is who you are, but I am calling out a greater destiny and a greater purpose on your life. You know, something similar happened to me. I found myself at the age of 22, completely at the end of myself. I'd spent years chasing after things, trying to fill the emptiness that was in my soul. I tried to fill it by chasing after excitement. For me, that was things like hard house music and raves and clubs. But I found that didn't satisfy the emptiness in my soul. I tried to fill it by chasing after ecstasy, but no matter how many pill, ecstasy pills I took, it still never satisfied the emptiness in my soul. I tried to fill it by chasing after girls, but no matter how many girls I had, it never satisfied the emptiness within me. And, and so I reached a point where I came to the end of myself. And at that point, someone came along and introduced me to Jesus. And I'm not talking, you know, someone didn't come along and, and I don't know what your story is, but they didn't tell me like a polished four-point gospel message uh, where they went through all the four points. Um, they didn't do that. It was someone at my workplace when I was at university in an evening shift, and they came up to me, and I knew them. I knew they were a Christian. And the one thing, the only thing I felt about them is that I knew when I talked to them that they didn't judge me no matter how I lived or how I was or how I spoke. I knew that they loved me and accepted me for who I was. And, and I remember she came up to me one day, the 25th of June, 2002, and, um, and she just looked me in the eye. And it was like Jesus himself was talking to me. And she literally, all she said was this. She said, Kev, Jesus just wants you to know that he knows you. He knows you and he longs for you to get to know him. Can't have been more than a few sentences. That encounter changed my life. It changed the entire trajectory that my life was going on. And you know, since then, as a Christian, I've walked on many paths. And I'll be honest, uh, some of those paths were paths that God wanted me to go on, that led me further towards Jesus. And as a Christian, I've walked on many paths that have actually led me away from Jesus. Um, but even through that all, I've heard the voice of Jesus saying, I desire ever increasing intimacy with you, Kevin. I want you to walk closer and closer and closer to me. And you know, the difference between me and my family, I, I have a sister and my mom, they're still living, they're in Bristol right now. But 
but they live in a lot of brokenness. They're in a lot of, uh, not literal prison, but, but they're in a lot of, of spiritual prisons with their mental health and just how they live. And they're bound up in a lot of stuff. And, but you know me, me and my sister and my mum, we've walked the same walk. We've been on the same journey. How have we ended up with such different outcomes? I'm not saying I'm above them. <laughs> Joe will tell you I'm still pretty broken. <laughs> Even as a Christian, no matter how long I've known Jesus, I still carry brokenness with me. Um, but me and Joe, when we talk, we come to the conclusion that what's the difference between my mum and my sister and me? And we come to the conclusion the only difference between us is Jesus. That Jesus has entered my life and transformed me and written my sto- rewritten my story. You want the next slide? Um, but you know, sometimes our stories, you know, God wants to rewrite our stories, but he wants to do something more than that. Because, however, you know, our stories can so easily become centered on ourselves. You know, me and my circumstance. And, and I can end up thinking that, that God revolves around my story and my agenda. You know, like Adam and Eve after the fall. Immediately after the fall, the, the result of sin is, is, is you see in their response, this word I just pops up all over the place. It, it says this, he says, when God said, where are you? Immediately they answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid. I was naked. I hid. Do you see like that their thinking is all skewed because suddenly it's all about them. They can't see outside of their own little world. And even as Christians, we can so easily do that. We can reduce God's story to my story. And, you know, Jesus did die for me. (laughs) He did die to forgive me. And he did die to rewrite my story. All those things are true But there's also a greater truth, guys, because God gently and graciously says to me, Kev, you are not at the center of the universe. Let me tell you something. I am at the center of the universe. Jesus is at the center of the universe and everything revolves around him. And and what he does is he says, I want to take you. As well as rewriting your story, I actually want to take you out of your story and I want to place you into a story that is so much bigger than yourselves. You see, I want to draft you into my story, says God. And you know, if you're here, uh, if you're not a Jewish person by birth, naturally, then that means that the Bible says from the Old Testament, you're a Gentile. Uh, I'm a Gentile. And if you're a Gentile, then actually all of us have been drafted into God's story. We've been taken out of our own little worlds and we've been brought into God's story. It's his story, history. Um, You see, even Jesus was born into a story of brokenness. You know, he knew pain and suffering. You know, it's like, like he might not have had the most ideal childhood that we maybe think he had. This is just speculation. But some theologians note that Mary is mentioned, you know, all the way through Jesus's life. After he's a child, Joseph is mentioned even once. And some theologians will say, well, maybe Joseph died when he was a child. Well, can you imagine going through that? Maybe you have been through that. I've never had to go through that. But as a child, knowing bereavement, knowing the loss of your father. If not that, then I'm still sure Jesus knew what it was as the man of sorrows to go through the, some of the brokenness that we go through. And, and then we read, even as a young boy in Luke 4, in verse 16 to 21, he, he quotes Isaiah and he quotes, you know, that famous passage where, 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 where it says, Isaiah says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor and to, to bind up the brokenhearted. And he reads that as a, as a, as a boy. And then, so, so he's taking the Old Testament story. He's taking God's story. And then he says, today, 
this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, he's saying, do you know what? God's brought me into that story. I'm a part of that story. Let's read some of the story that we've been drafted into. So if you want to have a look at Matthew 1, this is like the text, the central text we're looking at today. Now, I remember when I was at Bible college, um, one of my housemates said to me, I, I was struggling with some stuff in terms of how I was living. And, and my Bible college friend said to me, um, Kev, have you ever looked at your family tree? And I remember saying to him, uh, you know, I, that's not going to help things. You don't know what my, fam my natural family tree is like. Like, you know, seriously, it's, it's, not, it's not a great family tree. And he says, no, no. He said, um, that's, that's, that might be your natural family tree. But there's something greater than the natural. And that something greater than the natural is the spiritual. If you ever looked at your spiritual family tree, and he led me to, to Matthew 1. So in Matthew 1, verse 1, it begins by saying, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. What was Jesus' story that he was born into? Because he's like the perfect example for us. Maybe he had a perfect family. Well, let's have a look. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac, the father of Jacob. Well, let's just stop there a minute. Hang on. Abraham, remember, you know, the great man of faith. You know, if you, if you have faith, then you're a son of Abraham. Abraham was a man of faith. He did great things. What about all the lies he told? You know, like when he, when, when he was scared of entering into a new land, and rather than saying, this is my wife, he would say, this is my sister. And, and you know how he had this habit, he, he, kept, he, kept, he did tell lies, and, 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 and he couldn't seem to break that habit. And guess what happens then? Then he has Isaac, and then he has Jacob. Remember, remember Jacob? Jacob, the great deceiver. The one, I want, where did he get that lion from? I'm serious. Things, stuff gets passed down from generation to generation. Maybe he saw it modeled in some of his grandparents. And, and then Jacob, you know, he comes his brother out of his inheritance. That great deceiver. We're talking about the genealogy, the lineage of Jesus. <laughs> um, what brokenness. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the fa father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Now remember Tamar? She's the, the, the poor woman who Jacob, who was, who was, who Jacob slept with. In other words, he slept with his son's wife. Um, Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashom. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab. Remember Rahab? What was Rahab? She was a prostitute. I thought, Jesus, I, this is your family, Jesus. And Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. And Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of David, the king. And David, David, the great man. I'm serious, the king. Who, was the, who, was, who, who God said, this is a man who is after my own heart. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Ah, are we talking about the same David? Are we talking about the David who saw Bathsheba, who wasn't his wife, bathing on a roof and said, I must take her, slept with her out of marriage and... And, and then, to cover it over, he arranged for Uriah, her husband, to be killed. Yes, we're talking about the same David and wife of Uriah. Solomon, he built the most spectacular temple that's ever been seen. How many wives did he have? The father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asaph, Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram, Joram, the father of Isaiah, Isaiah, the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. 
Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Amos, Amos, the father of Josiah, Josiah, the father of Jehoconah, Jehon, no, I've done so well till then, haven't I? Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. You see, things in their family tree got so bad that God actually said, I'm going to have you taken into exile, which basically means a foreign army is going to come and, and take you know, take you away from Jerusalem and from God's temple. Because actually you're no better than the peoples of this earth. Um, and then we go into the home straight. After the deportation to Babylon, Jekyana was the father of Shetiel, and Shetiel the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel the father of Ebiod, Ebiod the father of Alikayim, Alikayim the father of Azor, Azor the father of Zadok, Zadok the father of Akim, Akim the father of Eliud, Eliud the father of Eliezer, Eliezer the father of Matan, and Matan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Christ. I deserve a round of applause for that. Um, and then the next slide. Um, so all the generations, because God's a generational God. He's interested from one generation to the next generation. From Abraham to David were 14 generations, then another 14, um, then another 14. Now, I'm a math teacher. Okay. I also believe in the Bible. I believe the Bible's the word of God, but I do like maths. So I did a little bit of maths here. Now you can do this yourself later if you want. But if you count the generations, there's 14 from Abraham to David. There's 14 from David to Babylon. If you count, I think there's only 13 from Babylon to the Christ. What's going on? The Bible's wrong. <laughs> Got to be, hasn't it? The Bible's wrong. Or maybe the writers of the Bible, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, were trying to make a point. If there's only 13 generations, then maybe there is a 14th generation that carry on and continue the story. Who do you think the 14th generation is? I think it's us. I think the writer had a little bit of a point. I think he was trying to tell us, do you know what? You're the next generation. You're, 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 the, you're the, 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 the carriers of this story. <clears throat> you see, all eyes in the unseen realm, guys, are on us as carriers of his story. If you don't believe me, in Matthew 13, 17, Jesus himself says, many prophets and righteous men longed to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. So we've been drafted into God's story. Think of the weight and the privilege that we've been given to partner with God in this story. It's like a relay race and the baton has been passed to us. What will we do with this baton? Let's just have a look then into, at the story of the world in which we live. We've got the next slide. Um, see, this is the story in which we live. Anyone know what this is? Auschwitz. In the Second World War in Poland, the city called Auschwitz, the Nazis occupied it and they built a concentration camp. And the purpose of this concentration camp was to round up the Jewish people, um, put them on trains, and it was a one-way ticket. Jewish people go in and they never come out. Uh, I don't know how many million Jewish people died, but it was a lot. Um, this is the story of humanity, our world. It was a long time ago, though, wasn't it? Maybe things have changed. Well, have a look at the next slide. Um, this is a picture called of a little Welsh village called Aberfan. Aberfan was uh, a mining village. And uh, on the 21st of October, 1966, there was a terrible landslide. Uh, and the landslide, unfortunately, it wasn't just an innocent, you know, accident. It was an accident, but 
as a result of coal mining, uh, the coal mining company's greed, they hadn't secured um, the, the slurry pits in a correct way. They tried to do shortcuts to make more money. And there was a tragic landslide that covered the, a lot of the village and a school. And basically when in the middle of the school day, um, a school with all the children, a whole generation of that village was wiped out. Um, what a disaster. Imagine if you lived in Aberfan during that time. What would your story be? What happens if that was your family um, or your children? Or even if it just happened to people that you know? Next slide. This here, a bit more recent. Um, in Ukraine, when war broke out, uh, we might know some Ukrainian people who have, you know, who have come over here. This here is a photograph, a real photograph of people trying to flee the war that had just, you know, been, that just happened to them. Can you imagine that? I don't know how many tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people in the Western world today who have just had to leave everything. That all they've got is the clothes on their back and whatever they can carry with them. Imagine the brokenness that they carry. This is the story of our world, guys. Got the next photo. Anyone know where this is? This is Greater Manchester. This is our city. This is the place where 2.8 million people call home. These are the stories. What sort of stories do the people who live here, what are they able to tell? The stories of some of our neighbours, some of our work colleagues, some of the people that we cross paths with as we walk to this church meeting this morning, maybe. Let me tell you about some stories that these people might be living in. 620,000 people in poverty. Maybe many of them not being able to pay bills. Maybe having to choose between food or putting the heating on. 15,000 people unemployed, schools facing an all-time crisis, parenting, people not knowing, parents not knowing how to parent, feeling at their wits end, not knowing how to cope, young people having a lack of direction and resilience, just being aimless in life, not being on the right path, a mental health crisis. 100,000 people in the last year access some form of mental health services. Crime. In 2021, there were 271,000 individual crimes committed in Greater Manchester alone. This isn't Gotham City. This is Manchester. This is our city. This is happening on our watch. These are part of the stories of our city <clears throat> and these people you see they don't know the way out of their story they've lost all hope they can't see a future they know that the things of this world don't satisfy but they don't know what is the answer of this story and then we've got let's put some faces to these stories this here top left is Andra and Lisa Rassau, parents of an eight-year-old, Safi, who was killed in the Manchester Arena bombing. They dropped her off with friends, went to pick her up, never returned. Can you imagine walking their journey? What's their story? Or top right, this is John Nahal from Sudan. As a child, he was recruited as a child soldier, became one of the so-called lost boys, one of the estimated 250,000 child soldiers who are trained to put, have a gun put in their hand um, from a young age and trained to be a child soldier. And as an adult, he, uh, he tries to restore lives of people who have been involved in that. What's his story? Or... This uh, man here, bottom left, John o Lancaster. You might notice he looks a bit strict, a bit different. He was born with Treacher Collins syndrome. He was abandoned at birth by his parents because of what he looked like. I wonder the sort of story he's had to live out. 
through his life? What's the outcome through? Or this here is the Fosco family from America. And uh, you can see all the family together, having a family yet together. And when COVID broke out, uh, in that photograph, five people within two weeks, five family members uh, lost to COVID, died. I wonder what sort of pieces they've had to pick up as a family. Broken people from broken stories all around us. If you could go to the next slide. You see, guys, people are looking for a narrative. They're looking for an alternative story from the one that they hear in this world. You know, there, is a, there was a bit of research done many years ago called the Jesus, uh, sorry, the Talking Jesus Project. And, uh, and they discovered that, that non-Christians are interested in Jesus, that they are interested in things like prayer and spirituality. Um, and there was a, a quote that someone said that, that if you want to change society, then you have to present an alternative story. World leaders know this. China, we lived in China for a couple of years. The Chinese leaders know this. If they can control the narrative, uh, they have the great Chinese firewall. No BBC, no Google, no Facebook, no Twitter, no Netflix. They control the story. The point is, guys, is that the story that people live is so powerful. We've got an alternative story, guys. And you know, it's not just about what we preach. You know, we can be part of rewriting the story by what we do. You know, my sister-in-law, she works in probation. She wants to play her part in changing the story of some of the people who have been caught up in crime um, in our city. Maybe it might be fostering or adopting. I know several people who have fostered children, adopt children. Might be people like George amongst us who is involved in training social workers. I still remember as a non-Christian boy growing up, I still remember the name of my social worker. In the middle of a pandemic when we're all thinking, how on earth do we get out of this? There was a couple in Germany um, who, um, who devoted their lives didn't sleep hardly for weeks, months at a time. And they, they ended up producing the BioNTech-Pfizer vaccine. They said, you know what? We want to re rewrite the story of this pandemic. Um, never reduce what you do in the week as just a tent-making thing. No, everything we do is part of rewriting this world's story. Let me tell you about Joseph's story. Um, Joseph, um, he, as a young boy, um, he had a word from God. He had a dream that, um, that one day um, uh, his brothers would all bow down to him. Maybe you've had a word from God. I, I know I've talked about Joseph in previous weeks. But what was Joseph's story? You see, Joseph's story didn't turn out the way he wanted it to. First of all, Joseph's story was affected by his own poor choices. I don't, I don't know whether it's sin or whether it's just not the best, what, best choice, but I don't think it's a great, it probably wasn't the best choice of his to go around boasting to his brothers. Do you know what, guys? One day you're going to bow the knee to me. It might have just rubbed it in a little bit. You know, Joseph, have some wisdom. But I wonder, sometimes the things we do can sometimes affect the story that we live in, the mistakes we make. But, but also then, Joseph was affected by other people's choices. You know, <clears throat> um, his brother's sin, his brother's jealousy resulted in him getting sold into slavery. Now, I don't care what anyone says. I don't believe it was God's plan for his brothers to sin because God never plans that anyone would sin. Um, but his brothers sinned and he ended up getting into, sold into slavery as part of a devastating consequence of the sin of other people. Um, and that's what happens, guys. 
We, can, we live in a world of sin and stuff happens, whether by our choices or other people's choices or just the, the fact that we live in a fallen and broken world. But in Genesis 50, verse 20, it says, what the enemy intended for evil, God intended for good. Do you see, guys, the enemy has a plan. He has a story that he wants us to live in. He has a plan for your life, and he has a plan for my life. But God has a plan as well. God has a plan for your life and my life and our city. And in Joseph's story, God had a, the enemy had a plan. The enemy said, I'm going to send Potiphar's wife to Joseph. And through Potiphar's wife, I intend to destroy Joseph. I intend to destroy his integrity. And from that, I will destroy the man. The enemy intended to destroy Joseph. But what you intended for bad, God intends for good. That God would use that story to actually the very thing that the enemy intended to destroy Joseph, and he used it to prove Joseph's faith and to prove his character. Um, and that ended up being the making of Joseph. And, and the end story for Joseph is that there was a famine in the land, just as there is in a broken world. There was a pandemic across the world. There was an epidemic of crime across the world. Schools were, were broken places. Wherever you work, broken places. There was, there was bad stuff going on on our streets. There was a famine. And what happened? Joseph was the only one who knew what to do. And Joseph got to partner with God in rewriting the story of the nation. So I just got, just really quickly, three things that can really help us to be a part of God's great story. Are you with me? Just three things, okay? First thing is Bible. We got this? Yeah, great. Get to know the story of the Bible. Now, I'm not just talking about, the, you know, like reading a verse a day. Get to know the overriding themes of the story that you find yourself in. You know, um, someone once said, that, um, that the story of scripture, the story that we're in, is like a Shakespearean play. That there were four acts. The story of creation, the story of the fall, Israel, Jesus. Um, but there's a fifth act. And the fifth act is that we get to carry on the story. But how can you carry on and live in the story if you don't know what story that you're a part of? So get to know the history of Israel. Get to know the ministry of Jesus. Get to know where you've come from, that you can continue this story. It's not a science book. You won't discover how old or how young the earth is. You might not discover if God created the world in seven literal days or not. You might not get to know the physics of how fast light and sound travel or the gravity force of the earth compared to the moon but you will discover your purpose. You'll discover the why you've been created. You'll find out who you're supposed to be. You'll discover the mission that you've been called to. We're at five, guys. We're living in the culmination of the ages, and we need to know the story that we've come from. Number two, belong. Um, Lucy's dance school, um, she goes every Saturday and two evenings a week, she goes to her dance school. But to her, you know, it's not a chore. Even when it's hard work, it's not a chore. Do you know why? Because after the first week she came back and she said to me, she was beaming. She said, it's really hard work, Daddy. But do you know, I think I found my people. I found my people. I found my people. I found where I belong. We all share this same passion. We all share the same drive. And when I'm there, Dad, I found my people. You see, guys, when someone's found their people, when someone's found where they belong, you know, you, when someone's driven by passion, 
When someone's driven by, this is, this is me, this is who I am, this is where I belong. Um, like, how much more do we want to create that sense of belonging amongst the people of God? amongst the church community, that I don't come here out of duty because I need to do a, a rota, but I come here because I found my people. I found where I belong. I found my place in this life and in this community. When I first became a Christian, the thing, and, and, I, and I was having to change loads of things in my life, and it was really hard. It felt hard at the time. The thing that kept me, don't get me wrong, guys, I'm a teacher. I love teaching. I love good Bible teaching. But the thing that kept me, I'll be honest, it wasn't the great Bible teaching. It wasn't even the amazing worship. It was the, the thing that drew me, that kept me, was this is where you belong, Kev. You belong with these people. We belong to a story. And the third thing is, is bless the world around us. See, in Genesis 46, let's go back to Joseph. Um, Joseph, he'd, he'd got put into prison. Loads of bad stuff has happened to him. Maybe you're going through really hard stuff right now. When you're going through hard stuff, it's hard to see outside of your own situation. Um, we looked at the eye before, what, what sin does. It reduces our world, to our universe, to me and God, and there's no room for anyone or anything else. Um, but Joseph, when he's in prison for something he didn't do, not my fault, God, he's in prison, and it says this in 40, verse 6, when Joseph came to some of his fellow prisoners in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. And he asks them, why are your faces downcast today? See, jo Joseph didn't just focus on his own disappointment. He took time to notice. He had capacity to notice that others around him were carrying their own disappointments. That others around him were carrying their own hurts. And from there, they told him his, their dreams. And from there, that was a key to Joseph interpreting their dreams and then getting released from his own prison. Do you understand that, guys? We get released from our own prisons as we seek to look out and bless the world around us. Why don't you take time this week to listen to the stories of those in your office or in your school? Why don't you take time to listen to their stories and what they're going through and what they're carrying right now? Maybe as you do that, you might find that that's the key to escaping from your own prison. There is a story, guys, for us to enter into. God does want to rewrite your story, but more than that, he wants you to enter into his story. C.S. Lewis, just going to finish with this, a great theologian, once said, all their life in this world and all their adventures had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last they were beginning chapter one of the great story which no one on earth has read and which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. Will you join me, says God? Will you join me on my story of transforming this earth?